Welcome to Jerusalem Unplugged, the only podcast dedicated to Jerusalem, its history, and its people. Your host, Roberto Matza, will bring you guests discussing their relationship with the Holy City. A journey through history, society, feelings, and hopes for the future. Follow the podcast on all social media platforms at Jerusalem Unplugged. Welcome to Jerusalem Unplugged, the podcast dedicated to Jerusalem, its history, and its people. I'm your host, Roberto Mazza, and today it's with great pleasure that I'm, I'm going to talk about one of the main characters of my entire research. I spent years working on Jerusalem and the history of Jerusalem in the late Ottoman era and in the period just uh, following World War I. And Roland Storrs proved to be the main character of that period. In this first episode, I will discuss the British military administration of Jerusalem and the biography of Ronald Storrs. In the next episode, I will discuss with more details the legacy of Ronald Storrs, looking at some of the most consequential decrees and bylaws that were implemented by Ronald Storrs as governor of Jerusalem. Quite interestingly, when I started my work on the history of Jerusalem in this particular period of time, walking around the city, I found some plaques uh, remembering Ronald Storrs, naming the first British ruler of Jerusalem. And so I remember one afternoon, must have been 2004, it was summer, I was living at the Kenyan Institute in Sheikh Jarrah, and I started walking down the street. and. Uh, I just sat down in West Jerusalem, right in front of a plaque commemorating uh, the British, King George, Herbert Samuel as the uh, High Commissioner for Palestine and Ronald Storr as Governor of Jerusalem. And so I began to ask questions to random people, really, uh, sitting in a coffee shop, whether they knew Ronald Storrs, whether they had any knowledge about him and what was the legacy of Ronald Storr. I guess to my surprise, back then, uh, I genuinely believed that people would know Ronald Storrs. Well, it turned out that no one, no one, literally no one knew Ronald Storrs. Only one person laughed at me, pointing with his finger at the plaque right in front of, uh, in front of us, uh, which is located at the um, corner of Jaffa Road and uh, Allenby. So I guess he just wanted to show me that, yes, he knew it just because he was written there. And I did the same exercise in other locations around Jerusalem, in the old city, in Sha'ik Jarrah, where I lived, asking uh, some of the people, some of the shopkeepers and, uh, and restaurant owners in the city. And once again, only a few individuals uh, told me that they heard of a name but they were not exactly sure who was he and what he did for Jerusalem. Obviously, there was an exception, and I met an old man in the old city of Jerusalem who knew everything about Ronald Storrs. But it's a long story, and he explained to me why he knew all of that, and so I really realized it was an exception. So today I really want to talk about Ronald Storrs. But before talking about the first British governor of Jerusalem, I need to provide a little bit of a context. Many of the episodes that we recorded in the past dealt with the British conquest of Jerusalem in 1917, but I never really tackled the question of British military rule. So let's start with uh, Jerusalem conquered by the British. Following the conquest of the city in December 1917, the British established military rule, which lasted until July 1st, 1920. From the perspective of the local population, the government of the city had passed from Ottoman rule to that of a new foreign power. However, the British were not only European Christian rulers. They had also shown their support for Jewish immigration and settlement in Palestine by issuing the Balfour Declaration, which by 1920 was not fully public in Palestine, even though it was widely known mostly through Egyptian publications, but it's only 1920 that effectively the British published the Balfour Declaration in Palestine too. 
By observing the main features of the British military in Jerusalem, and in particular, the administrative structure, it may be possible to note the main continuities and changes between the Ottoman and British administration, as well as discuss the role of the military in relation to the local elites and the Zeiss Commission. Although the civil administration of the city after 1920 has been studied extensively, the military administration has been reviewed as a transitional period. Irrespective of a poor academic attention or popular attention, this was a rather formative period. Indeed, military rule forced the renegotiations of several aspects of Jerusalem, politics, urban geography, language, and the economy, amongst other things, were all reshaped according to the requirements and values of the new rulers. The military establishment was generally reluctant to engage with the complexities of high politics. So how did their rule affect the city of Jerusalem? To answer this question, I want to pay attention to one of the key characters of the British administration, the military governor, Ronald Storrs. Military rule did not create a complex structure of government in Jerusalem, but was based upon a high concentration of power in the hands of Storrs. As military governor, Storrs ruled the city almost undisturbed between 1917 and 1920, de facto reshaping the city according to his sense of aesthetics and his own values. And aesthetics is very important. We will talk about aesthetics because there are certain decrees that Rostor's issued which impacted Jerusalem and later on at large Palestine for decades to come. And in fact, some of these we can consider his legacy. Despite the military's dislike of politics, in the 30 months of military rule, Jerusalem was the center of great political activity. The British were preoccupied with defining the rule in the region, while the local population was more concerned with the reshuffling of the local political milieu and the emergence of a complex Arab Zionist struggle. Eventually, the Nebi Musa riots, which we discussed in a few uh, episodes ago of April 1920, proved to have a generally underestimated impact on local politics and British policymaking. Jerusalem, as the new capital of the region, became the locus of a tripartite political struggle involving Arabs, Zionists, and the British, with the occasional external intervention of actors such as religious institutions and other foreign governments or international institutions that were emerging at the time. So let's look at the military rule with more details between 1917 and 1920. The actual establishment of military rule in Jerusalem took place the day Allenby entered the city on December 11, 1917. The first military governor of the city was General Bill Borton, who was postmaster general of Alexandria and had been involved in the Sudan campaign, later serving as governor of Khartoum. The military administration of the region was left to Allenby and then to the OETA, Occupied Enemy Territory Administration. Eventually, a chief administrator who was also in charge of appointing the military governors of the five districts into which the country was divided, ruled Palestine in Allenby's name. Three chief administrators held office in this period, Major General Arthur Money, General Watson, and Major General Louis Bolts. The execution of policy was left to the war office, although it was acting under instructions from the foreign office. The leading principles of the military administration were drawn in the Manual of Military Law, compiled at the Hague Conference in 1907, which imposed on the occupied army adherence to the principle of status quo antebellum. In other words, you cannot change anything that was already set before the war. According to international law, the military administration of occupied territories had to preserve the status quo in order to avoid the introduction of changes in both procedures and legislations. The governor of Jerusalem, Ronald Storrs, who replaced Borton after a few weeks of governorship, confirmed previous administrative arrangements. So, the former mayor of Jerusalem, Al-Husaini, 
retain its privileges. Yet, the Jerusalem municipality was deprived of any real power, and the mayor became a figurehead. If you remember, Palestine Naili, in the episode we recorded with her, she called this process demunicipation. She called this process demunicipalizations, the idea of removing the municipal power of Jerusalem. The municipal administration was simply charged with the task of liaising between the local population and the British. Significantly, the military administration could not radically change the system of taxations. The military regime established by Allenby was supposed to be temporary and last only as long as military needs prevailed but eventually lasted two and a half years. The length of the military administration mirrored the uncertainty in London regarding the future of the Middle East, not just of Palestine, and particularly of the strict maintenance of the status quo, was also meant to avoid French-Italian antagonism, especially considering that Picot of the Sykes-Picot Agreement immediately began to pressure stores to increase French visibility in the military administrations, whilst the Italians began to protest against the liturgical honors given to the French, because the French, yes, were, were still the official protectors of the Catholics in the Holy Land. At the conclusion of military operations, the former Arab territories of the Ottoman Empire were divided into three military administrations. Palestine was part of the OETA South, ruled solely by the British. Technically, the administration was acting under a chief administrator as mentioned earlier, who received orders from Allenby, who was responsible for creating the laws in the occupied territories. Lots of bureaucracy. Which also means lots of documents for us to study and understand all the mechanisms that ruled Palestine. Besides, the chief administrator, a chief political officer, CPO, was appointed, attached to the expeditionary force of Allenby. General Gilbert Clayton, was the CPO, and he received orders directly from the Foreign Office, and the relationship between the Chief Administrator and the CPO was never clearly defined, creating a sense that the Foreign Office was effectively in charge, despite the fact that the military government was part of the Egyptian Expeditionary Force, and therefore, theoretically, under control of the War Office. Politics was never absent from controlling this new acquired land. In this context, it is because of the supremacy of the Foreign Office over the War Office that, in line with the Balfour Declaration, the British government allowed a Zionist commission to travel to Palestine to work as an advisory body to the British authority. And as many historians noted, this essentially was a, an act that broke the status quo, and more importantly, created some sort of a parallel government. Because the Palestinians... The local Arabs are not given the authority to create any counter-commission, any counter-body that would somehow balance the arrival and the power of the Zionist Commission. The first task of the military administration was to cope with the general lack of food, medicine, and fuel. In other words, it had to cater for the needs of the army and the civilian population. The army re-established a railway connection to the city through the reconstruction of the line between Jaffa and Jerusalem, and food was brought from Egypt. Like Borton, stores had to face the immediate necessity of obtaining supplies for the city, and decided that the distribution should be placed in the hands of the municipality. The activity was to be supervised by representatives of all three religious communities, Muslim, Christian, and Jewish. I think this is a very important element because it tells us that from the very beginning, from the get going, the British, and particularly Ronald Storrs, understood Jerusalem only in religious terms. The idea of removing municipal power was essentially the idea of removing secular power in order to convey this idea that re Jerusalem was a religious site. And if obviously communities were divided and they had to be treated uh, equally and differently at the same time. So I, I think this is an important element to remember when we think about the arrival of the British in Palestine, in Jerusalem in particular, and the work of Ronald Storrs. From the very beginning, 
of his administration, the idea was to remove this Ottoman secular power, which obviously looked at you know religious divisions the, through the millet system, but on the other hand, also provided services to everybody in relation to the fact that you know they were offering services as a municipal service to the inhabitants of the city, regardless of their religion. But stores did the opposite. So the activity of a distribution of food should have been supervised by representatives of the communities, suggesting that maybe there was a lack of trust. Maybe there was a potential for conflict, which was not there anyway. Within the boundaries and limitation of the status quo antebellum, the military administration, in order to administer the occupied territories, established departments like Department of Health, Law, Finance, and Commerce. Health was obviously priority, and the Health Department started to operate in 1918 with the purpose of fighting an outbreak of cholera and typhoid, and to deal with a widespread disease like malaria or trachoma. In restoring essential services, the OETA was assisted by the American Red Cross, via the South Zionist Organization of America, and the Syrian Palestine Relief Committee, established by the Anglican Bishop Rennie McInnes. Their main purpose was to reorganize the hospitals, improve the sanitation of the city, and provide relief which, in the final stages of Ottoman control, was done mainly by the American colony, through a soup kitchen and direct help to the inhabitants. Veterinary measures were also taken in order to eliminate cattle disease. The shortage of water and the lack of a proper drainage system at the beginning of the occupation, however, impeded the implementation of the full sanitation works needed as it was also found necessary to restrict the water supply. Because of this, the royal engineers started to pump water to Jerusalem from several reservoirs around the city, but the problem of water was not solved satisfactorily until the 1920s. In the legal sphere, the British appointed a senior judicial officer who exercised control over the courts and land registers and eventually also worked as legal advisor to the chief administrator. Ottoman criminal and civil law was largely maintained. Although Arabic remained the official language of plea in the courts, the business of the courts was carried out in English with simultaneous translation into Arabic and also Hebrew which became obviously an, an official language with the establishment of the British Mandate in Palestine. A court under the authority of a municipality was also established dealing with minor criminal offences. Religious courts were maintained, but they had jurisdiction only matters regarding personal status, such as registration of marriages, birth and deaths, and also solved disputes concerning Muslim wakfs. Overall, the military administration preserved the Ottoman system of courts, but reduced their personnel. The only court of appeal in the region was established in Jerusalem, composed of two British and five local officials. Former Ottoman state schools were slowly reopened, and the first measure taken was to replace Turkish with Arabic as the medium of instruction. Hebrew was used only in private Jewish schools, such as the Jewish educational institutions, the Alliance Israelite Universelle. In 1917, the military administration appointed Major Williams of the Indian Civil Service in order to rebuild the educational system. He was replaced by Major Tadman of the Egyptian Ministry of Education in October 1918. Non-governmental schools continued to function, offering religious and technical education. According to a report of the Palestine Zionist Office, the name of the Zionist Commission during the mandate, at the end of 1919, there were 94 Jewish educational institutions, 32 kindergartens, 45 primary schools, 8 secondary schools, 4 business schools, and 1 school of music. Government schools were mainly attended by Arabs, as these classes were taught in Arabic, though in some Christian schools Arabic was also used as a language of education. The Zionists established the school system which paralleled public education, though the schools were attended only by Jewish students. Funds were needed to carry out the reconstruction of basic infrastructures. According to Charles Ashby, the civic advisor of the military administration, the first works of reconstruction carried out in Jerusalem 
or sanitation at service, engineering and scavenging. And attention then turned to the preservation of the Holy See. And this was obviously the masterpiece of Roma stores. Nevertheless, the military administration was not entitled to change the system of taxation. And I mentioned that earlier. And it sounds like a silly part, but actually it's an important one. And it proved quite difficult to collect revenues from a starving population to pay for the reconstruction works. As noted by stores, the immediate liabilities of Jerusalem far exceeded its assets. The principal sources of revenue were still custom duties, house and land tax, tithes, animal tax, fees of court, and the surplus from the post office. The British administration modified the method of collection and abolished the most uh, oppressive uh, taxes and fees like the temetu, which was a professional tax, imposed mainly on merchants and artisans. A number of licensing fees and lastly, the tax to avoid forced road labor. Apart from the budget, the military administration introduced the Egyptian currency. As the Turkish lira had lost all its value, it was also declared illegal. The new currency did not win public confidence, however, as some locals expected Ottomans to return. Later in 1918, in concert with the Treasury, the Foreign Office ordered a removal of the restrictions on the Turkish currency. However, people were no longer by then interested in the old money, as the Egyptian pound had slowly gained the confidence of the public, and it was quite clear that the Turks were not coming back. This to an extent implied that people had understood the Ottomans would never come back, and the British were likely to be there for a while. The military administration also worked towards the re-establishment of commerce and industry. After six months of British rule, commerce was lively thanks to financial grants by the British and military administration to local entrepreneurs. Ronald Stores personally endeavored to support the establishment of local industries. The British administration developed a legal and economic framework in which businesses could expand. However, investments belong mainly to the private sector. And we should say that after conducting long studies of this and with more and more publications available, now we know that most of that money and support was mostly given to Zionist enterprises. In the process of establishing a framework for commerce and industry, 1918 stores renewed the Jerusalem Chamber of Commerce, which he actually claimed he founded. Meanwhile, the military administration temporarily prohibited the import of articles such as salt, printed matter, cotton, copper, and other materials in order to promote local industries. Licenses for the import of these goods were eventually issued by the administration in Jerusalem after payment of the necessary fees. Once the foreign consuls were permitted to return in 1918, their role as promoters and intermediaries of their own country's industries restarted. In responding to a request for information from an American firm about the transport situation in Jerusalem in 1918, the American consul, for instance, uh, Otis Glazebrook, stated that there were no private cars in the city and only a few bicycles, but he predicted large commercial possibilities in the future. That year, Glazebrook also replied to an American enterprise interested in the cinema business. Although this time the consul was more pessimistic, telling the firm that there were free cinemas in Jerusalem, but that they could not afford to buy films at the moment. The question of the local police force was one of great importance, as the different religious groups wanted to be represented within it. The force for Jerusalem region was reorganized and reduced, as in the opinion of the military, it was necessary first to improve the quality of the core. Towards the end of Ottoman rule, there were two police systems in Palestine and in Syria. In Jerusalem, there was a municipal police force composed of uh, trained policemen and regular army troops under the command of Ottoman senior officers. The second force was a gendarmerie composed of irregulars called to reinforce the local police force in times of troubles, such as riots. In the early stages of the British occupation of a city, responsibility for policing fell on the military police. However, a city police force was re-established soon after and by January 1918. 
one British and several Arab officers led a total of 340 men engaged in police work. By July 1920, with the establishment of a civil administration, the Palestine Police Force was born. The force was composed of 18 British officers, 55 Palestinian officers, and, and 1,144 ranks, mainly local Arabs. Some Indian Muslims were employed in the police force in order to serve in the core protecting the Muslim holy places. During the Nabi Musa riots in 1920, as we saw, stores claimed that the local police force was only partially trained and lacked tradition, perhaps a way to avoid responsibility. Stores was referring to the fact that the local Palestinian officers continued to enforce the so-called Turkish system of policing which meant obtaining confessions and gathering information by using physical violence. I wonder if in Britain was that different. Zaris, meanwhile, requested that the military administration recruit more Jewish police officers for Jerusalem, but also that the selection of the officers be controlled by the Zionist Commission. The military were ambiguous in their response, as they did not want to be involved in political games despite strong pressure from the Zionist Commission. Although the military government was closely involved with the local issues, officers carefully avoided direct involvement with the foreign and war offices regarding the future of Palestine. With the establishment of a military administration, the foreign office decided to postpone crucial decisions in relation to Palestine and Jerusalem and left to the military the business of local politics. On Christmas Eve, Borton Pasha, the first military governor of Jerusalem, who, as I mentioned, uh, served only for a few weeks, attended mass at Bethlehem, and he found himself involved in a clash between the French and Italian representatives. It's not a surprise that a few days later, Borton resigned as governor, overwhelmed by the duties of the role. This was possibly due to a breakdown in his health, but also perhaps because he was unable to deal with the religious and political issues that had emerged amongst the various communities of Jerusalem, and he had no appetite for that. So on December 28, 1918, Roland Storr was appointed Lieutenant Colonel Governor of Jerusalem. Storrs had no military experience. He had previously served as Oriental Secretary to the residency in Cairo. He was meant to act as a bridge between the military, which disliked, or perhaps did not really fully understand, politics and the political establishment in London. Groups such as the Zionist Commission and the Arab Christian Associations, as well as the internal questions among the religious groups, forced the military to face the inevitable issue of politics. Something for which Ronald Storrs claimed to be trained or to understand. The military had to deal with local politics as it was charged with enforcing the status quo while waiting for events to develop, but the arrival of the Zionist Commission, and I mentioned that earlier, was considered already contrary to the principle of the status quo, and its work interfered with that of the military administration. According to the Foreign Office, the Zionist Commission was to be entrusted to a British officer under General Allenby's command, but with a direct link to London. In the Foreign Office plans, the Commission was to represent the Zionist organization and act as an advisory body. The main objectives of the commissions were to form a link between the British authorities and the Jewish population in Palestine, to coordinate relief work direct towards the Jewish community, to develop Jewish colonies, to assist Jewish organizations, and lastly, to establish friendly relations with the Arabs and other non-Jewish communities. However, the commission and its members the fact to try to sell Zionism as an acceptable ideology and to paint European Jews as non-foreigners to Palestine as indigenous. Indeed, through this project of the Foreign Office, it is possible to understand why the military thought of the Zionist Commission as a competing parallel governmental institution. To an extent, the military permitted the peaceful coexistence of the people in Jerusalem, albeit at the high cost of limiting the freedom of the population, the main concern of the military was public security and distribution of basic services, which were 
dispense under martial law. In the spirit of a status quo antebellum, the British did not distance themselves from the politics of the notables, the Ayan, but continued the Ottoman practice of relying on the main families of Jerusalem. Once again, the local notables were to play their role as intermediaries between the local population and the administration. The mayor appointed before the war by the Ottomans, Hussein Salim al Husayni, remained in office. It did not hold any effective power unless it was specifically granted by the British, as in the case of the distribution of the relief after the occupation. And when the mayor died early 1918, Storr appointed the most prominent member of the Husayni family, Musa Kazim, to replace Husayin. He was a political activist who, once in charge of a mayoral office, was initially tactful in his opposition to the British. However, he was dismissed after the Nebi Musa riots. Notable Arab families were able to maintain their power base, and by opposing Zionists, they in fact managed to increase it. The leaders and the young cadres of the notable families were ready to deal with the new rulers, as well as support their own political causes with a stronger voice, as suggested by the creation of the Muslim Christian associations and other political organizations. Following the arrival of the Zionists, Muslim and Christian Arabs found a common ground that unified them in both ideological and political terms. That does not mean they were not united before, but certainly, you know, there was a rift between the two communities, despite the fact that they shared the same identity. This unity was then transformed into political action controlled by the notables themselves. Nevertheless, it has been noted that though Palestinians possessed a strong elite, they did not possess a charismatic leader. The lack of a charismatic leadership, however, did not prevent the rapid development of a political consciousness, which increased steadily in strength. However, in the long run, we may say that the lack of a charismatic leadership proved to be uh, fatal for the Palestinians, as many other scholars noted, particularly in relation to 1948. Despite the growing Arab nationalist movement, the most complex relationship of the military administration was with the Zionist Commission. When Chai Weizmann arrived in the region as head of the Zionist Commission in 1918, members of the military administration expressed their disappointment and surprise. General Money, chief administrator, was highly critical of Zionism and of British support to the Zionist cause. Although his opinions might also have reflected a strong feeling of anti-Semitism, in fact, quote, Jews were as a class inferior morally and intellectually to the bulk of the Muslim and Christian inhabitants of the country. Following the occupation of Jerusalem, the chief political officer, Gilbert, Gilbert Clayton, expressed to Sykes his concerns in relation to British support for Zionism, as he feared it might alienate Arab support in the region. Louis Bolt, the last chief military administrator, became disillusioned with Zionism after the Nebi Musa riots of April 1920. In fact, he acknowledged that the Zionists were not ultimately claiming a national home but a Jewish state. The only pro-Zionist member of the military administration was Colonel Richard Meinertzagen, the chief political officer who held the office from March 1919. He supported the Zionists, as he claimed they would be the most loyal friends to the British in the Middle East, and he added that the administration should have been purged of anti-Zionist elements. Although the members of the military establishment were concerned with the political situation, they never publicly expressed opinions about it. The military proved to be more concerned with practicalities than politics. They saw the Zionist Commission as a threat to their legitimacy, as the bureaucratic apparatus of the Zionist Commission was running almost in parallel with the British administrative one. The commission was officially charged by the Foreign Office to carry out under Allenby's authority the steps necessary to establish in Palestine a Jewish national home through the formation of a link between the British authorities and the Jewish population of Palestine, providing assistance to Jewish organizations and population and the collection of information with a view to the further development of Jewish settlement. It would not be surprising then if the military administration considered the Zionist Commission as an arrogant newcomer. Furthermore, some British army officers believed during the war that the Ottoman government was controlled by a group of Jewish Freemasons who had infiltrated the COP. 
there's always time for a conspiracy theory to add to the story, right? The second relationship of the military administration was with the religious groups of the city, primarily the Christians. The British military administration, particularly the governorate of the city, was ordered by the foreign office to settle matters between the religious denominations regarding the holy places directly rather than through intermediaries. The chief administrator was also ordered to allow for the return of those religious leaders who had left Jerusalem at the beginning of the war. A careful eye was placed on the Greek Orthodox Church, as it had been the most disrupted after the conflict due, fi due to financial constraints. Roland stores who had power over the status quo often moved physically from one church to another in order to control and prevent breaches of the status quo. This time we're talking about the status quo of the holy places, which was established by the Ottomans and changed throughout time since the 18th century. He also tried to involve the churches in public discussions regarding the future of Jerusalem. When Storrs founded the Pro-Jerusalem Society in 1918, in order to develop various projects on Jerusalem, he brought together the Franciscans, the Dominicans, the Orthodox, the Armenians, the Anglican, etc., etc., etc. Members of the different denominations were quite skeptical with regard to the British military administration. We were most skeptical being the Anglican bishop in Jerusalem, Rani McInnes who continued to blame his fellow countrymen for allowing the establishment of the Zionists in Palestine. Bishop McInnes became quite disillusioned and in early January 1918 said he believed that the British authorities were very afraid of the political difficulties in Jerusalem but preferred to delay any serious political discussions on the future of the city and of Palestine. In previous episodes, I discussed Otis Graysbrook the American consul in Jerusalem, as well as Conde de Bayobar, the Spanish consul in Jerusalem. Both were the leading foreign representatives during the war period in the city. Ronald Storrs rose in prominence under military rule. A proper study on Storrs as governor of Jerusalem has never been published, but scholars have dealt with this figure through studying the beginning of the British mandatory government in Palestine. Storrs has been portrayed as a despot and an autocrat by several scholars, as well as some of his contemporaries. And Storrs played the part well, claiming in fact in 1920 to rule the Jerusalem district like his predecessors into inverted comma, Pontius Pilate. And I just want to mention that probably the best work uh, to date, uh, other than my own work, uh, is of um, uh, Yair Wallach, a previous guest of the podcast, uh, discussing his book, uh, which really uh, includes many of the uh, work and decrees issued by uh, Rona Storrs, including the full discussions about uh, naming the streets of Jerusalem. But let's go back. Who is and who was Rona Storrs? Storm was born in 1881 in Bury St. in Suffolk, in Britain. He was the eldest son of Reverend John Storrs, a vicar in London and then Dean of Rochester. Storrs was interested in languages, culture and the arts and read classical studies at Pembroke College in Cambridge. To this day, Roland Storrs papers are available at Pembroke College. So anybody interested, you can go and uh, still access the old microfilms. Some material has been digitized, but essentially all of the Roland Storrs collection is out there in Cambridge. So he then entered the civil service in 1904 and was appointed to the Egyptian civil service in the Ministry of Finance until 1909. He was then appointed Oriental Secretary to the British Agency in Cairo. It was with this appointment that Storrs had the chance to show his skill with the Arabic language and was able to prove his abilities with Middle Eastern affairs. But let me say clearly, his Arabic was good, though According to the sources we have, many complained that his accent was too British to be fully understood. With the outbreak of the war, Storrs was appointed assistant political officer to the Anglo-French Expeditionary Force in order to deal with the Sharif Husayn and Thomas Eliot Lawrence, T. Lawrence, right, who led the Arab revolt against the Ottoman 
and in 1917 he was briefly appointed to the Secretariat of the War Cabinet. Following the capture of Jerusalem and the resignation of the first military governor, Bill Borton, Storr was appointed governor of Jerusalem, and he served until 1920 as military governor, and then from 1920 to 1926 as civil governor of Jerusalem. As a governor of Jerusalem, Storr's main concern was to rebuild the city after the war and, in his view, to harmonize relations between the different religious and ethnic communities. As sources are contradictory, it is difficult to say whether Storz was pro or anti-Zionist. Both sides claim the other. He did, however, pay special attention to Christian matters. Not surprisingly, he was the son of a clergyman. As shown in his memoirs, which we should take with a pinch of salt, perhaps a big one, and especially by his two meetings with the Pope in Rome in 1919 and 1921. We need to make sure to understand that religion and religious identity was paramount for him, and that eventually was reflected in his understanding of Jerusalem. In a note by the French Foreign Office in January 1918, Roland Storrs is portrayed as being against French interest in the Middle East, it was claimed that it was Tours who censored all Egyptian press articles discussing French achievements in the war in order to diminish French appeal to the local. A few weeks later, following an investigation of a French chargé d'affaires in Cairo, French opinion of Tours became more conciliatory. He was no longer considered a gallophobe, but rather a great enthusiast for French culture and literature. Nevertheless, Storz was never fully appreciated by the French authorities, and Italians too were quite skeptical of him. In April 1920, following the Nebi Musa riot, Storz was accused by the British Court of Inquiry, as well as by general public opinion, of having been negligent. In 1926, Storz's career in Jerusalem came to an end, as he was appointed governor and commander-in-chief of Cyprus. In Cyprus, he found a similar situation to Jerusalem, as the island was divided between the Turkish and Greek communities. Although he proved to be balanced, so the sources seem to say, stores could not avoid clashes. During the riots of October 1931, for instance, the government house was burned and his private art and antiquity collections destroyed. Twice in his career, stores faced the outbreak of violent riots, and it appears that in both cases, he could not have predicted nor prevented them. After Cyprus, Storz was appointed as governor of, by then, northern Rhodesia. He was clearly out of his environment, as he had little knowledge of uh, sub-Saharan Africa. And during his time there, Storz suffered from tropical disease. And in 1934, he retired from the civil service and went back to Britain. He then dedicated himself to local government for Islington Council in London and was active in social life promoting cultural and music societies. Rural Stores died in 1955, survived by his wife, but no children. Interestingly, there are no traces of stores in 21st century Jerusalem. There are no memorials, plaques other than a name on Allenby, or statues despite the fact that some of the decrees issued during his rule had a huge impact on setting the character of modern Jerusalem. Roland Storz unequivocally intertwined imperial interest and his personal views in his style of government, aesthetics. A key principle we will see in the next episode, a very high civic and religious sense and a feeling that Communities of the city should be involved, led stores towards the creation of a pro-Jerusalem society in 1918. Without giving too much away for the next episode, with the British occupation of Jerusalem, planning in colonial and non-local terms for Jerusalem begun. The local notion of space was to be reshaped, and the traditional geographical units of the old city, like the courtyards, the clusters of houses, and small squares were to be replaced by the concept of segregated quarters. Regardless of what the local inhabitants might have desired for their city, Rona stores 
initiated the planning of a city following, according to him, the basic policy of the status quo. Stores never transferred the activity of planning to the pro-Jerusalem society. The minutes of the society meetings proved that the planning of the city was never even discussed. Stoll was a preservationist. He used the status quo of the holy places and expanded its idea and concept to protect the old city and its environment. Rather than promoting changes and particular developments, he believed in the idea of making Jerusalem an open-air museum. But all of this will be discussed in the next episode, when we will see the true legacy of Ronald Storrs. We will see and discuss his decrees, the laws and bylaws implemented during his tenureship as governor of Jerusalem, first military and second civil, between 1918 and 1926. Stay tuned for the second episode dedicated to Rona's Tours and British Jerusalem. Thank you. Thanks for listening. If you enjoyed this episode and you'd like to support the podcast, please share it with others on social media or leave a rating and review. To catch all the latest, follow us on Instagram, Twitter and Facebook at Jerusalem Unplugged. Thanks and I'll see you next time.